with the USB and get that out of the way and is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. She's also a fellow of the Institute of Strategic Management of Nigeria. Shayo is a seasoned corporate strategist, financial analyst, and a management consultant with 30 years cognitive industry experience. She has floated and successfully run several companies along which, among which are Charlottetel Corporate Solutions and Stratnavit Consulting. She serves as non-executive director on the boards of several companies where she provides professional support and strategic oversight. She also completed the advanced management program at Lagos Business School, as well as a course in disruptive business strategy at Harvard. She is a skilled business growth um, strategist, social media influencer, you might have noticed her there, a multi-award winner, and a self-motivated change agent with strong strategic and entrepreneurial skills. She's driven by a passion to add value and facilitate positive change. Also a seasoned public speaker, facilitator, trainer, and a conference host, and a major focus is strategy, innovation, leadership, and self-development. Oh, that was not me. <laughs> that was me, apologies. Okay, show you with that lovely introduction. And in the normal circumstances, we would have been with you in Nigeria. Um, but we're on the virtual platform and it enables us to also invite many of our other alumni in other areas. So over to you and all the best. We look forward to the session. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And um, once again, welcome to the session. I want to say thank you to everyone that has been able to join wherever you're joining from all around the world, Africa and other parts of Africa, Nigeria, South Africa, East Africa, Ghana, wherever, I'd like to say a very, very big welcome. This is going to be a very interesting and engaging session. And this is how we are going to run. We are going to go straight into the session with our esteemed speaker, who I will be introducing in a moment. And after her, her discourse, uh, we will invite questions and comments. Please feel free to use the chat function to write your questions, and I'm sure our speaker will attend to all your questions. Immediately afterwards, we are going to have an information session. Now, I know a lot of us might be interested in the programs that USB has to offer, the MBA, the MDev, um, the PhD programs and every other program, there's going to be an, a session immediately after now, and all your questions and concerns and information will be addressed in that session. So I want to encourage every one of us to, you know, go enjoy this first um, networking session and then stay on for the information session. And so right now I'm going to just give a brief introduction to our topic and like i said it's going to be very engaging and it's going to be very um, informative the covid 19 pandemic has affected the quality of life of africans and just as this has throughout the entire world covid 19 restrictions introduced by various governments have considerably have been considerably effective in mitigating the effects of the virus but the impact has been marginal and it has come at a very high economic cost and consequence. In 2021, Africa is projected to recover from its worst economic recession in half a century. Real GDP growth is projected to grow at about 3.4% in 2021 after declining by 2.1% in 2020. The projected recovery, though incomplete, will be vaccine fueled and underpinned by a resumption in tourism, a rebound in commodity prices and the rollback of pandemic induced restrictions. Other factors include the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, the progress in structural transformation, accelerated digitization and work from home arrangements. The downside factors include mutations of the COVID-19 virus, the debt overhang, subdued commodity prices, 
tourism remittances, social tensions, and climate change induced shocks. The COVID pandemic has changed the landscape. Many governments in Africa announced fiscal stimulus packages ranging from 1 to 32% of the GDP. Debt to GDP ratio is estimated to grow by 10 to 15 points in the short to medium term. It is estimated that Africa requires about $155 billion between 2020 and 2021 to deal with COVID-related expenditure. So what is the way forward for Africa? How do we harness our potential, abundant natural resources, and highly skilled labor to make a difference? How do we address challenging issues like poverty, corruption, social unrest, and unemployment? How do we rebound from the harsh economic recession caused by the COVID-19 pandemic? New wine into new wine schemes, an alternative approach to Africa's economic reconstruction. To answer all these questions and more, and do justice to our topic, is a seasoned educator, philanthropist, and gender equality advocate. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day, Dr. Tabiseng Muleko. Dr. Muleko is a PhD in Development Finance Illuminus, a Development Economist and Senior Lecturer at the University of Stellenbosch Business School where she teaches economics and statistics. Previously, she served as CEO, project manager, and researcher at the Eastern Cape Socio-Economic Consultative Council and worked extensively in the economic development landscape. She also serves as a commissioner for the Commission for Gender Equality appointed by the president in 2017 and is currently the deputy chairperson. The Minister of Trade and Industry appointed her as Board of Trustee for the National Empowerment Fund, where she chaired the Board's Investment Committee 2018 to 2020. The Minister of Higher Education appointed her as a member of the ECALA TV, TVET College Council in 2014, where she serves as the Deputy Chairperson, Member of EXCO, and Chairperson of the Academic Board. Tabi Seng holds an honors in business science economics from the University of Cape Town and a MPhil in development finance from Stellenbosch Business School. She completed her PhD in development finance at USB on pension funds and national development and is the first South African woman to be conferred a doctorate in this discipline. Ladies and gentlemen, let's appreciate our speaker as I welcome her to take over from here. Tabi Seng, you are so welcome. We're really, really looking forward to um, this discussion. And you have the floor. Thank you, Shayo. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, very good evening to everyone who took time out just to hear what Stellenbosch is really about and also to listen to a bit of, um, I think, uh, enthusiasm from my side. Um, thank you for that very long intro. Um, I'm just a young woman who loves the continent and wants to see it developed. And so I'll cook myself. And uh, fortunately, I've been able to be in some structures where I hope to uh, bring change. And I think we all should be on that same journey. One of the biggest things about the USB, um, which I have learned while I've uh, been here, is it's a key uh, value uh, that the USB seeks to see where we use uh, education to transform our society. So it's not enough for us to simply acquire executive education or acquire postgraduate degrees. But the real question is, what do we do with them given the constructs and the constraints that we have on the continent? So one of the things I was very fortunate to do last year uh, is to conceptualize with um, various other economists uh, solutions for the continent, solutions for Africa. And where we started out was in a very small room in Stellenbosch. And uh, it culminated to this report that I'm going to share a little bit about with you. I'm not going to assume everyone here is an economist or even has a background in economics, so I'll take it a little bit slow, but I will share with you some of the recommendations from that report, put some of the things within the context of Africa, because of time, obviously, we're limited in what we can share and engage on, but I will try and be as broad as possible, and I look forward to your questions um, in the chat session as well. So it started out uh, in South Africa. We looked at what can we do in in, in South Africa in terms of uh, 
All right, can you hear me? I see that I was muted by mistake. I'll continue. Where the title comes from is a real verse that I believe strongly in, uh, whereby I believe you cannot do old things in a new context. Otherwise you will destroy what you're trying to achieve. And I really believe strongly in the concept of new wine, pouring new wine into new wine skin. We want to see a new continent. We want to see a transformed continent. We want to see transformed leadership. We want to see things that are really looking forward and instead of looking back. So new wine into new wine skin title fitted quite precisely in that. And looking at alternative economic strategies, why? Because we want to see a transformed continent and a transform South Africa. So I thank you for having me today and I look forward to uh, engaging. What is the structure of my presentation? I start out with the state of affairs and what we see on the continent uh, is, uh, what I wanna say is that we know that the continent is not homogenous. Uh, we know that there's West Africa, there's a Central Africa, there's a south, uh, Southern part and there's the Northern part in terms of countries. And there are very specific uh, issues in each, particularly not just region, but if you look at each country by country, if you do analysis uh, per country, and I would recommend that we do that, but just looking at the aggregate now because of time, uh, we know that in the continent, we have a labor force participation rate that is just over 45% at 46%. What that means is that more than half of your people in the labor, in the labor force over 15, under 64, are not necessarily participating in the labor market. They're not actively uh, participating in that. Um, this is issues of absorption, and this is the precariousness of the labor market dealing with each country by country. But on average, this leads to, us to about 9% uh, unemployment. What is important about unemployment is that country by country, this differs quite dramatically, uh, region by region as well. So you can't look at the aggregate. I would advise us to look at, at even from a gender perspective, even from a youth perspective, we know that almost a fifth of our young people are not in economically active positions, nor in education or training. So they're not participating in the economy, but they're actually not being trained, nor are they actually uh, gainfully employed, which is a concern, is where are they using those energies? We know that more than 34% of our people, 429 million Africans are living in poverty. That leads us to that 34% poverty rate. And with COVID, we know that this will increase by just over uh, 38 million people that will now go into the low, they will enter into the poverty trap who previously had come out of poverty. So some of the gains that have been made on the continent are actually reversed. We also know with the continent, uh, our, our, our panelists, our rather our facilitator moderator for tonight has mentioned the 3.4% uh, growth, the contraction primarily because of COVID, we've had a flat growth rate, but the average African growth rate, just to add, is at 4% on average year on year, slightly lower than your emerging markets, but you're also seeing that some, the biggest economies are dragging the growth of the continent down, but more so Southern and Western Africa. But you're seeing Ghana really come out uh, strongly in terms of uh, fast, fast paced growth. Uh, but I'll show you some of the regional um, nuances so that we see what is happening. The real question for me is, are we gonna continue with business as usual? Because remember before COVID, we already had 429 million Africans in poverty. Before COVID, we didn't necessarily have a, 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 a high rate of a labor force participation, not necessarily doing so well with our, our participation of the youth in the labor market. And I think GDP growth is quite positive. We've got a majority or 60% of the fastest growing economies in the continent. Uh, but the quantum, is it enough to deal with the quagmire of underdevelopment? Um, we know uh, this is a slide that I, I like to show here. This is a South African specific context, not Africa. But if you zoom into each country, what we need to look at is how many people are actually living below the poverty line, right? How many people out of your, uh, out of your uh, more than 1 billion Africans are living below the poverty line, breaking it down to your country by country analysis. The total is 429, jumping to 465 now post COVID because that was in 2019. This is a big number. In South Africa, it's over 30 million people. What happens then is that most of your people are reliant on social grants. This results in your primary balance or your fiscal expenditure 
a majority or a big portion of it going to social cohesion or social uh, social expenditure rather, which means that um, you're not necessarily able to gain sufficient necessarily momentum from uh, revenue enhancement from those 17 million. And obviously you want to make sure that those 17 million go into your economically active population. We also know that there's a problem of inequality in the country. And I'll explain a little bit more on the continent in South Africa, it is quite worse where you have 90% of the asset wealth owned by a mere 10% of the population. There is a gender dynam dynamic in South Africa. We also know it's not a South African phenomenon. Generally on the continent and the globe, there is a, what we call a gender pay gap. An average on the continent, 24% globally. South Africa is at 30%, 30 where irrespective of the work you're doing, you actually as a woman would earn approximately 30%. It ranges from between 23, 27%, depending on the sector, uh, but this is the average. And we know that the unemployment situation in your sub-Saharan SADC countries, particularly Southern African countries, is far higher than the rest of the continent. South Africa is probably the worst unemployment rate in the, in the continent and one of the worst globally at 42%. Uh, youth go as high as uh, 63% if you look at the what we call the broad or expanded definition. And then it goes up to uh, 75%, 74, let me round it to 74, 74% uh, for those uh, in the expanded definition, simply saying that those who have not continued or have stopped looking for work. Um, so we see that uh, this is primarily linked to what we see in the secondary schooling outcome. What happens to your learners once they come out and complete what we call secondary school? We know now that only 13% of our youth who exit the school system either enter into training to a Tibet college or FET college or what we call an artisanal or what you use your hands with college, technical training college, and then uh, the, the, the rest go into university. That 13 and a half percent, what happens to the rest? And this is an issue in all of our labor markets to say, is there enough of a catchment for the youth when they exit the schooling system? Only a small minority can actually enter into university and what happens with the rest? The outcome, if you would multiply this on the 54 countries in the continent, this is from UNCTAD and they look at the least developing countries globally. And where do you see the majority is here, right? Sub-Saharan Africa. You see that the majority of our countries and economies, uh, this is the Middle East, you see here that, uh, and some Asian economies, these are the islands, but the majority of the least developing countries are actually on the continent. And the majority of the continent in itself is least developed. So you don't have a uh, majority of your countries in the higher income or middle income. We are sitting with least developed economies and lower income economies. And this speaks to the quality of life, the human development index of our people. Where do we come from? And I'm showing you this because it's important for us to have a picture of where we come from. A lot of the time, if you listen to this, I got this from Getty Images, uh, you see a lot of uh, negativity. But if you look at the history of the continent, uh, these are structures that we were able to generate in Mali, Timbuktu. These were and are still in place today, 200 BC. This is 200 years before Christ, according to the, uh, the, the calendar uh, that was set um, uh, at, at the time. We were able to be a center for scholarship, a center for mathematics and science and arts. If you go to the northern parts, we know that scholarly uh, work was done and we were a repository of academic and commercial um, center. We had the Trans-Saharan trade, a route that de dealt with salt, gold and ivory mining, uh, trading those to the east and moving those all the way to Asia uh, from your African uh, components. Ivory was also moved from your central and your southern parts of Africa into your Asian uh, from your, uh, your, your east coast um, and that trade route that was there forming towards Asia. We see that we as Africans were scholars, we as Africans were at the forefront, not just of mathematics and science, but also the arts. Look at this amazing structure that is still in place today uh, that you can see in present day Mali. Why have we lost our position in the globe? Why, when we were once an academic and a commercial center, have lost our position? 
And how can we regain this, I think is the question. And this is where I began to think and, 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 and ponder to say, what can then uh, we do as academics to contribute to this discourse? So we know the problems, right? I'm gonna share a little bit more about the problems. We know that we have underdevelopment, poverty and unemployment. But the question is, what is the necessary condition to transforming the outcomes? I believe one of them is obviously uh, enrolling at the USB, but the secondary to those are the ones that I will share with you now. Uh, so we know the African growth story. For me, growth is uh, not as important as the outcomes of growth. Growth we can see has happened uh, on the globe. You can see that that's the Chinese. On average, uh, we're seeing that the Chinese growth story uh, in the last decade has been over 6%. You're seeing that the world generally and, um, and, 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 and the emerging markets here have seen a growth rate of slightly below uh, the African projected uh, growth rate. But we still have the fundamental underdevelopment challenges of the continent. Africa is the orange blocks in the, in the horizontal bar charts. We also see that the big five in Africa are driving most of our economic growth. Uh, the top five countries um, are Algeria, South Africa, Nigeria, Morocco, and Egypt in terms of quantum or the quantity that they add to the gross domestic product. More than 50% comes from these five countries. So for the last five years, they actually uh, would influence the direction of the growth story of the continent. So you see here that this is the rest of the countries here. Uh, if you remove those four, those five, and then these are the five here. The biggest being Egypt, followed by Algeria and also Nigeria, which is the uh, maroon here. And then you see there that uh, South Africa and uh, Morocco simply are fairly equal in terms of quantum. And you're seeing that most of these are, are, are driven by commodities markets. You're seeing that the, 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 what's happening primarily with the change in commodity prices has influenced the growth exchange rate, uh, particularly those that are oil exporting countries. A lot of them are here. And those that are not Many of our countries are not major exporters of manufactured products, and especially those smaller ones. Uh, why I say that, look at our net exports. Uh, economic outlook from the African Development Bank shows us from the last 10 years where mainly our economic output is coming from. And you see that the green over the last decade has primarily been the largest contributor. Uh, you see followed by the orange, which is gross investments. You've seen in the last three years, around 2019, 2018, where you began to see higher proportion of investment than consumption, but we slip back into consumption exceeding your level of uh, investment. Your exports, right, your net exports, uh, here you can see that you had a trade balance which was negative. What this means is that simply uh, we were importing more goods than we were selling, selling out. And this affects uh, your fiscal, your trade balance. This affects your balance uh, of accounting. Uh, your, 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 your. Um, you see here that also this blue, your government expenditure in terms of what you collect, in terms of taxes, revenue, and other sources, uh, as a driver, and your government expenditure as your driver to growth, uh, as well as quite minuscule, uh, equal almost to your uh, trade balance. Most developed countries are not driven by consumption. Most developed countries have a growing and a widening, I'll go to the right here, uh, secondary sector. Uh, uh, but we see in Africa, we're mainly driven by services and agriculture, uh, minimally industry. And this is primarily where I think Africa needs to look at growing, look at expanding, look at frontier markets, look at developing its own growth trajectory by producing goods and producing goods that they consume. Uh, to deal with this maroon here, which has really hit us quite hard in terms of our primary balance, in terms of all of our other economic indicators, even our gross national income, our ability to, to generate our own income, because we largely, in some of these countries, if you were to break it down, our remittance is driven. So even if you see the investment, if you were to break that up, it's money that has been coming capital flows that are coming in simply because our family and friends are sending us money from uh, OECD economies. What is happening in comparison to other emerging markets? This is something that's in the new wine report. And we compared uh, Ghana, Ethiopia, uh, South Africa with uh, some of the other uh, emerging markets whom we all as Africans like to equate ourselves to by looking at the per capita GDP uh, growth rate. And we're seeing it, look at the Chinese and the Indians, they by far exceed us. Uh, positive growth story is Ethiopia, 
and Ghana. Ghana is doing quite well also in the last year uh, with its, with its uh, per capita GDP based on its increased output. Uh, but in comparison, you're seeing more uh, growth coming from the other emerging markets and our level of growth simply put uh, in the southern parts uh, Egypt and Arab Republic, you can see here uh, at just over 2%, uh, the South African uh, contraction and at the lower level, the Brazilians. Uh, and this speaks to when you look at your total output divided by your population, you can actually see how you spread that. And, and one of the things that points to this issue um, of quality of life is your per capita GDP. Inequality is another measure. Look at the African story. You can see that we have a problem with inequality. I don't believe inequality is only a, a South African problem, but it is quite a severe in South Africa. That's why it's pointed out, it's the highest. But you're seeing Namibia, you're seeing Lesotho, you're seeing Eswatini. These are Southern African countries I'm pulling out purposely. Zambia, Zimbabwe. We're quite high in Southern Africa in terms of uh, our inequality. And inequality is a problem for distribution of wealth and income. So even if you grow, if only a 10% concentration of your people gain the, the benefits of your growth, this is a problem. But you're seeing on the West Africans uh, and Central African, East Africa, for an example, Tanzania here sitting at around 40 or 0 0.9 in terms of your uh, Gini, slightly uh, uh, higher with uh, Uganda here. But again, these point to a problem with inequality in Africa where there is a political elite, there is an income, middle income, and there is a very big gap between the rich and the poor. And you're seeing that with the level of inequality across the continent. And then you can measure and look at where uh, indices are quite high, what then must be done. Uh, you see the Democratic Republic of Congo here. You see some of the West African counterparts. Egypt is probably one of the lower levels and Niger. Uh, you're seeing there uh, with the lower level of your um, inequality, Algeria as well. So you're seeing that this is quite a, an issue, even though we've seen Rwanda uh, come through with some amazing growth story, inequality is a problem, slightly higher than Nigeria. And, and you're seeing that this has to be uh, responded to adequately across the board. Uh, the economic crises of COVID we know about. We know that pre-COVID, most countries were growing at a specific flat rate. Africa had over 4% growth in average. We know that uh, some of the uh, East African and Central African economies were at 6% over, um, but then COVID happened and we've seen the, 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 the shocks. We've also heard, uh, as uh, Shayo has explained now, that the shock has given us the lowest recession or the worst recession we've seen in decades. And this is true, but the question really is, what are we gonna do post COVID? How are we gonna recover? Many of our economies due to the structure that I showed you, we're consumption driven. Economies that have recovered quite fast are those that manufacture are those that are actually productive because they build their economies and are able to trade quicker, able to recover and then uh, see the multiply effect at work in their economies. But most of our economies are services driven sectors where we don't produce, where we rely on tourism and services. So if the airports are shut down, we don't have entrance, we're not able to operate, right? Um, financial services is driven by manufacturing and people working. Those are reliant on people having income, reliant on people having movement of capital. And if you have a 30% wage drop on average, this is gonna have a, a show uh, real losses in terms of performance of banks um, and, and then financial intermediaries. So the structure of our economies really needs to be reviewed. And so we are seeing a weakening of outcomes. Uh, interesting thing that uh, I wanted to look at and wanted to share with you today is a lot of indices are done on the continent. A lot of uh, institutions are overseeing the development story of Africa. Some examples I've listed here, whether it's the United Nations Development Program, the World Bank, they're doing business and in index in, in, in the continent. The United uh, Nations Conference on Trade and Development, they do several reports on the African continent, whether it's productive capacities index, illicit financial flows. There's several reports on the African free continental uh, trade agreement, uh, illicit flows, you know, economic development reports. We've got the economic outlook uh, from the African Development Bank that is published annually. I'm not sure what the Chinese have because I've tried to find uh, their reports and from their research entities, they, uh, they, they don't share those publicly. I, I presume if any of you have those, send them to me. Uh, but we have noted that across the globe, everyone seems interested in what's happening on this continent. Across the globe, uh, reports are done. Uh, 
uh, about the movement of capital, the movement of trade, e-commerce, what is happening in mobilizing capital, our livelihoods being improved on the continent. And, and we're seeing this across the globe. The question is, what are Africans doing about all this information, right? What are Africans doing about all this information about financial flows, the problems on the continent, and are we able to transform? Uh, what we have seen is that 2015, we weren't able to meet our eight uh, millennium development goals. Uh, we then said as, as, as the globe, oh, well, let's make them 17. Uh, let's push back uh, the millennium development goals to SDGs now, so they're now called sustainable development goals and multiply them by two, back to one, and they're now 17. And we don't know whether by 2030 we will get uh, and have reached them. Uh, but I think every country should have at least the responsibility for its own people outside of the uh, sustainable development goals, its own target of lessening poverty, lessening uh, mortality, making sure your people have access to education, making sure that uh, you are able to uh, have equality and, and empowerment of all in the economy, particularly those who have been marginalized and mainly that is women. And so all of these things should be things our leaders are concerned about. And I think that if we were concerned about, we would meet these uh, goals even without external parties uh, driving them. So what is the alternative framework? I've got a little bit of time to share in terms of what the alternative framework would be uh, based on all of the shocks of COVID whether it's lower commodity demand, household earning dropping, whether it's tax revenue declines, we've seen substantial uh, decline in annual output and contraction of sectors. And what the new one into new one skin says is that most countries need to look at a decisive economic strategy as a basis, at least. You've got to transform your factors of production and reform your value chains and distribution channels. You have got to enhance productivity. These are the minimum. Uh, there's a lot more detail in that paper and that report, um, and I would want for you to read it, download it, it's on the USB website, um, but it's important for us to understand that how the newly industrialized countries of the Asian economies change their economic output is that they decided to have targets to improve productivity. They said, we've got to double our manufacturing value added sectors. They, just, they started where we are. They made sure that they boosted local productivity, agricultural productivity, and exports from manufacturing value-added sectors. This is key. And I don't know if you look at most of our value-added sectors and our exports, we are exporting raw materials. We are exporting products that we have not beneficiated. Steel, iron, ore, chrome goes raw. Uh, manganese goes raw. Oil goes raw. We don't beneficiate or manufacture it into goods that are enhanced. Cocoa goes raw. Tea goes raw. We don't process our goods. Uh, cotton goes raw. So where the value is and where the real enhancement is, is in manufacturing and in adding value. And we've got to carefully look at how we use technology to advance growth. It's not a misnomer that it's, it's not uh, something we're not aware of where labor intensivity uh, is seen to be a trade-off to, uh, uh, to, to technology. This can be done in some sectors. And so you've got to carefully maneuver between policy and needs for your country and look at how do you make sure, depending on your human capital needs, that technology doesn't completely suppress the demand for labor. Remember, the goods that these machines are producing have to be consumed by someone. And if you don't have people with income, it doesn't matter what the goods you produce are, there will be no one to buy. Right? So you've got to make sure that you maintain that balance uh, of uh, competitiveness and efficiencies, but also enhancing your uh, labor absorptive sectors. What's happened in the continent post COVID? We've seen a deteriorating fiscal ba balance. Uh, what this says is that how much of your uh, revenue are you spending more than uh, you're collecting revenue? So we're seeing that the 0% means that we're on the negative, we have a, a deficit. Most of our governments across the continent uh, in the regions are spending more than they collect, right? So you're seeing that from 2019 uh, to projected next year, uh, East and Central Africa are performing better than the other regions of Africa. West Africa is doing better than Northern and, uh, and, 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 and Southern Africa. The worst uh, behavior is here in the Southern African uh, and driven by South Africa here, uh, driven by Egypt here, right? These are the big economies. Uh, the worst performer here, Nigeria drives the rest of the uh, outcomes here, primarily with the poor and worsening fiscal balance. So you're seeing here that 
on average, it's between five to 10%. And this basically, if you were to break it down, you would see how much money you're collecting as a, as a government and how much are you spending. And generally, this means that your revenue is less than your expenditure, causing you to have that less than zero uh, percent of your GDP that is actually uh, negative. And hence, you end up with that negative fiscal balance. So this is the situation across the continent. It's not just um, in, 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 in Southern Africa. You're seeing the same across uh, 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 the debt is going, where we then meeting our, our, our finance deficit, we're meeting it with debt. Resource intensive uh, countries on the continent, the African average is here. You see with the brown line here, sitting at around 60% of GDP, 70, over 70% now. So you can see it's worsened over the last 10 years. You can see here, right? We were sitting at 31% of GDP debt level in 2012. Median public debt was at 31%. We were doing fairly well. It rose uh, to around 53%. Uh, you're seeing that it goes up here and then it rises uh, year on year by about 5% concern. Where is it sitting now? Over 70%, right? From 10 years ago, we were at less than, uh, we were 31%. We are being told now that we need more than 154 billion in terms of finance, financing needs. We currently know that at least six countries are in distress, 20 are on the brink of entering distress as well. And this is a problem for the continent in terms of how it finances growth. My proposal is that we look at alternative ways to raise capital, one of them being domestic resource mobilization. And we, we will see that as uh, I go to that. Uh, a third of our uh, debt comes from uh, Chinese creditors and 10% of that 30 billion uh, in the last, uh, in 2021 is the Chinese Development Bank. Interesting. The Chinese have actually lent us approximately in the last uh, uh, seven years between 2000 and 2017, 143 billion, 143 billion dollars. And so this is significant. We can have a discussion on why, what does this mean and, and what does this actually lead to? Uh, I'll quickly, uh, skip these slides because of time. Uh, we know that we've got six of the 12 fastest growing economies. I want to stop here. My belief is that one of the things that I recommend is that we've got to look at strategic interventions in our economies to see different outcomes. Most of our economies are not industrial uh, or manufacturing led uh, driven economies. We've got to industrialize. If we're gonna change the economic fortunes of the continent, our macro policies and our institutions have to align to that. We've got to adopt labor absorpting strat absorptor strategies, primarily using our state to actually enhance this. We've got to start producing our own food, basics. We've got to look at rural development, why? Because the majority of our people are actually living in rural areas. So when you look at rural development, putting roads, infrastructure, water, electricity to those who are not necessarily in the urban centers, we're actually spreading the wealth, we're spreading the gains, we're halting urban migration, and we're improving the livelihoods of those who are not in the cities, and it may actually improve the general uh, GNI of our countries. Domestic resource mobilization is key in this, where we begin to look at pensions and other assets domestically that will actually enhance our economic outcomes. The strategy of looking at short and long term is key for our st strategic uh, fiscal stimulus, and you've got to look at different interventions. I'm definitely not for stru uh, structural adjustment programs uh, that were in, in, in implemented by the Bretton Woods Institution in the 80s. These have not helped us. For us to simply continue these type of adjustment programs is not going to help us. So we've got to look at strategic fiscal stimulus short term, but if we do borrow, let's use it for productive and enhancing our manufacturing or income generating activities and not simply pour it into consumption right, where we simply ex use it for social welfare or expenditure or compensation of employees, that is not going to generate long-term growth, right? Uh, we've got to build the state capacity across the continent. Uh, this is key. And if we don't do this, we're shooting ourselves in the foot because the poor are helped by the state. The markets will not intervene for the state. The markets have market failure. They're driven by profit. It is the state that looks at the interest of the 429 million poor Africans. And we've got to build state capacity. And primarily, we've got to grow through redistribution. So these are the key seven pillars. There's a lot of detail in the report. It's about 123 pages. I uh, encourage you to read it. But we've got to do these things if we want to see alternative. I'm going to stop here. Uh, to just say that we've got scenarios there, we can model with models, you know, there's a lot of outcomes, but taking us back to the end, we were once 
uh, had the richest man on earth, Mansa Munsa. He's worth more than Bill Gates ever was. Uh, this is Africa. Uh, we traded uh, salt. We, 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 we were the refrigerators of the world. Uh, we traded copper, silver, artistry, the Ife Kingdom, the Obalufa II, uh, had governance systems. We were able to govern ourselves through African ingenuity. And uh, in southern parts of Africa, we had the Great Zimbabwe, where we farmed and had livestock, built walls that are still around today, traded gold and ivory, uh, exported these to Asia and other parts, and had great architectural feats. This was Africa. This can still be Africa. But the question is, are we willing? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Tabi Singh. That was a really, really powerful session. And um, I'm sure that, you, I mean, you've left us with a lot of thoughts. And um, I guess that we will take all of this back with us and begin to see how we can contribute to the reconstruction of um, Africa. Um, I'd like to invite questions at this time. If you have questions, comments, please, feel free to either raise your hand if um, you want to speak or put your questions in the chat in the chat box meanwhile i'll just give a quick recap of um what the of the discussion so far and you will agree with me that our speaker for the day has really done justice to the topic um dr muleko started with a diagnostic assessment of where africa stands as it is today um, she highlighted some of the current challenges that we face on the continent, unemployment, poverty. And then she asked the question, are we looking at business or as usual or COVID recovery? She went on to explain that Africa was once the center of trade and international commerce, mathematical excellence and technological advancement. However, you and I will agree that all of the glory of the past has somehow been lost and most of the the most of some of the most underdeveloped countries on in the world are found on the continent of Africa. So how do we regain our lost glory and how do we turn these things around? She went on to encourage the implementation of alternative policy reforms and encourage the development of existing natural resources and increase in manufacturing. And then she finalized with um, some to direction and um, pointed us you know in the in the right way on how we can actually restructure our continent and she mentioned just to mention a few um some strategic interventions she asked us to look at industrialization she also con uh, said we should adopt labor absorbing strategies consider domestic resource mobilization and public sector participation we need to build state capacity and of course we need to also build strategic state stimulus. So thank you once again, Dr. Muleko. It's been a wonderful um, session with you. Um, yes, I have a comment in the chat box and says, um, from Alex says, wow, Tabi saying that was quite a mouthful and on high speed. Thanks for the food for thought and quite a lot of this, um, quite a bit of disillusionment. Yes, I think um, Tabi Singh has really let us realize how great a continent Africa is. And unfortunately, we are not harnessing the greatness that we have. We need to turn things around. I have another com comment from Christelle says, what a wonderful and passionate presentation on Africa's reconstruction. We are still waiting for more comments and questions. I am sure that we have questions. Um, to ask um, Dr. Ta Dr. Muleko today. Um, I have another, oh, okay, um, okay, yeah, this is a response from Tabi Singh, right. So we're still waiting for more questions, uh, more comments. Um, and also, let me also use this opportunity to remind us that immediately after now, we are going to have uh, a um, an information session, all the programs that the USB features. If you are interested in the PhD, or if you're interested in the MDev, or doing an MBA, um, please wait after this session. And we are going to have a very impactful session by Dr. Yako, and he will throw more light on the programs of the USP. Anthony, I can see your hand is raised. Um, please unmute yourself and go ahead with your question. Right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Anyway, first of all, thank you very much for a very interesting and dynamic presentation. The one thing which you've left out, to me, is the most important thing. The business schools have failed 
to train people to administer the sort of growth that we need in the economy here. We have the total focus on leadership all the time. Everyone wants to be a leader. We don't need leaders now. One leader is enough. We need managers. We need administrators to run the countries to make everything work. And I think that's where South Africa failed. And that's where the rest of Africa failed. And the business schools are the ones that have failed to be able to produce people that can actually run, run the business economy. That's my question. What can the business schools do to improve the quality of administration and management and forget about leadership for change. Thank you. Um, thanks, Anthony, for that question. Um, I think that uh, there's, two, there's two parts to the answer is uh, the issue, let's, let's separate the, there's the private and the public, right? There's the public sector management of state institutions, management of uh, state run or state led uh, government agencies. Uh, then there's the private sector run. And you're seeing, I think uh, we would, for me, I would not separate particularly when you talk about uh, failure, I'm not sure in what, in what aspects you, you refer to it as, uh, but if you were talking for an example, uh, with South Africa, there's been the issue of state capture, which basically has been about business being complicit with the public sector officials at a high level um, of softening funds from the state uh, through various state entities. And, and this is part and parcel with you've seen uh, companies and uh, families that are, or individuals that are very uh, highly uh, or closely linked um, to political power. And also on the side of uh, business, you're seeing uh, global multinationals, uh, companies that have had to return monies um, that they've overcharged, uh, you know, and a lot of in, were ill gotten uh, uh, hundreds of, of billions that have been returned to ESCOM and other state institutions. So the problem I think in terms of uh, problematizing it, I would not necessarily say it's a problem for business schools. For an example, a business school, South Africa has, I would, I, I'm not sure about the statistics, one of the business schools is the Stellenbosch uh, Business School. The, the number or the proportion of the workforce that is uh, privileged enough to actually be in business schools, I would say is a minute proportion of the whole. The leaders or the uh, outcomes of the business school and the alumni of the business school, the relationship of those individuals and in their enablement to drive and enhance value I don't think it's necessarily a South African issue because if you go to uh, Europe and you go into, let's go to the US, the war, the, uh, the Lehman Brothers, the McKinsey, the, the global uh, financial uh, multinationals that were drivers and behind the downfall of, 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 of the uh, financial structures of the world are highly complicit in the downfall of the ninja, the, the Fannie Mae's and the, and the ninja, no, no income, no job, um, asset lending, which led to the downfall in 2009 of the financial crises. Most of those individuals who are in those, uh, in those financial houses were in also some of these elitist, I'd say, uh, business schools. And I think that the question is not necessarily uh, a South African or an African problem, but I think it's a global issue of is the education, and it's not, I would say, an uh, issue that you can drive at business schools, but is the education, even the school leaving ones, because those who reach uh, education of, of, of executive or business schools are even less, I would say, than a percentage of your labor force. But is the education that you give values that you in, in, inculcate in your people, in the society, able to transform and trans transformative? Is the education that you have going to enable, even if you have a grade 12 or an O level, A level, are you going to contribute to the economy? What type of a worker are you going to be? What type of principles will you be productive? If you were to compare a Japan, a China, or any of the East Asian economies to maybe an African economy, you may find that irrespective of business schools, the labor productivity in maybe Central Africa, South Africa, Southern Africa, West Africa is the same but you'll find that there's more business schools in this part of the world than there are in other parts of the world. So it's a very complex question, but I do think that it's an education question. I agree with you, Anthony, to say, are our education facilities empowering our people sufficiently so that our people are able to economically advance and contribute 
to the development of your country. Even if you're a lawyer, if you're a lawyer that's a thief, it doesn't help us, right? So you may be very educated, but you've got no values. So I think for the USB, uh, one of the critical things uh, that is done through the different programs, whether it's MBA, particularly the MBA side, I know with development finance as well, is introspection, looking at yourself, looking at your own personal development, looking at your own values, revisiting certain things and practices that may not necessarily be particularly useful for growing an economy and growing uh, and advancing uh, economic gains and so forth. So I think it's very critical uh, that we be concerned about these issues. Thank you so much, Tabise. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for that. We have two more questions, which I think we can quickly squeeze in before our time is out. And I have one from um, Huli. He says, wow, Doc, that was a passionate and thought-provoking presentation. You are highly gifted, inspired for days. He says, in the case of South Africa and a lot of former colonies in Africa, we've had a lot of clever policy recommendations that have not availed much. I believe colonial and apartheid legacy is responsible for failure of these smart policy recommendations. Should our focus be economic policy interventions as much as it should be about political re-engineering to address historic injustice? Sorry, I lost uh, to address in, to address historic um, injustice. Sorry, I've lost where I was. Uh, to address, sorry, I'm, I can uh, see the question, uh, Lady Shayo. Okay, read it. Thank okay, you. so go ahead and answer the question. All right. Thank you so much for that. I think. The economic story of most of our African counterparts and African economies is closely linked to the political economy. We have got to understand that the political economy does drive the economic outcomes for most of us. Most of our nations are not devoid. So in the uh, development of an artisanal class uh, in South Africa, it was closely linked to the political political uh, masterminds at the time. Unfortunately, they developed what we call uh, apartheid as a system uh, to exclude the black Africans. However, uh, they developed while they did that an Afri Afrikaans artisanal class using the state-owned enterprises. The, 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 the political economy, uh, you can go to different uh, diasporas because of time I won't go into the different nations, but the political economy, the political uh, policies of the political class, uh, the economic policies drive the national policies, right? They drive the national economic policies. And this is a critical uh, issue that we must uh, take into cognizance. I'm not sure if you want me to answer the other question. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I think we can, we have time for about one more question. Um, so if you can quickly answer Sam T's question, if you've read it. My issue, Sunny T, is not just implementation. I don't think, I think we overemphasize implementation. If you don't plan to win, you cannot, even if you implement a plan, if that plan doesn't equate to improving the livelihoods of your people, doesn't equate to enhancing the export capability, enhancing the productivity, enhancing what are our targets? If I can ask you now, if you look at all of our countries continentally, what are the national targets that we have for manufacturing value add? To what extent will those decrease poverty? How are we going to add and manufacture manufacturing as a value added exports in all of our subsectors? What are the plans that we've put in place to make sure that we change the outcomes? Merely looking at GDP growth, and not looking at redistribution, restructuring of our economies, that will be, uh, I would say, a short sell for us. So I think planning is much more important. Planning, executing a plan that will make, lead to impact. Executing a plan that is not going to lead to outcome change, for me, is not good enough. So I think it's it's got to be that we look at implementation of plans that are going to lead to restructuring and reconstruction that I will support. Thank you so much. Thank you so much once again, Dr. Moleko. It's been a very engaging and interesting session. And I'd like to also thank everyone that has participated in this session. I'm afraid we won't be able to take any more questions as at the moment. Um, I don't know if um, the moderators will allow us while we are waiting for the transition, we are about to start uh, the new, the next session, which is the information session. So I'd want to encourage all of us to stay on as we transit to the information session where we will, um, okay, um, Christelle is saying that, yes, we can take on um, the next question. So I'd like us to still wait 
um, in the in the meeting here, uh, we will be transitioning into the information session. So we've been given permission to take one more question. So Dr. Muleko, could you please take the question from Wumi Ajayi? She says, thank you, Dr. Muleko, for this insightful presentation. It's a solid reminder that African nations must wake up and not dwell on the losses from COVID-19. Can you talk about how African countries can integrate its manufacturing activities into regional value chains through AFC FTA. Well, <laughs> I don't know what AFC FTA is. So. It's, the, it's the Continental Trade Agreement. It's the free trade. Okay. Area. Yes. Okay. I think, let me simplify for me. Um, can we choose to have products that we have what we call economic complexities? So each region, each I'd say each African region, whether it's West African, uh, Southern African region, uh, Northern African, uh, Central African region, we have uh, economic complexities. Some of our regions produce agricultural commodities. Uh, these are not processed, right? They can be processed into markets in the Southern, in the Western, in the Eastern parts, right? Others have raw min minerals, whether it's uh, uh, oil, uh, we have uh, gold, we have copper, Let's, particularly in the southern and the central and the western parts, oil, let's beneficiate and have an organized way to uh, distribute these per country. Because remember, we've got the issue of heterogeneity in, South, in, in Africa. Not all countries are necessarily highly advanced. We've got a large plethora of our economies that are least developed countries. So for what they need to enter into the African continental free trade area and to gain from that is different from a, a manufacturing or a more advanced economy like Nigeria, Egypt, or South Africa. They they have gains that they can quickly leap into and make gains by exporting because they already have economic complexities. What do I mean by that? They already manufacture certain goods, process certain goods within the subsectors that are largely developed by um, their own manufacturers, which other countries and economies don't have. So I think that for integration, decide as a region and as a, a, a country what goods you can produce. Decide on the frontier products or the range of products where you may have economic complexities and tailor your trade finance, have a line of trade finance capital and infrastructure that requires planning, right? Infrastructure that will enable your subsectors, your entrepreneurs and finance. So you've got to have trade finance, capital mobility and mobilizing finance in your regional and your local hubs that can actually produce so that you can actually export. The other important aspect here for trade and particularly for the free continental is is, is, is logistics. We've got to move these goods. Do we have ports? Do we have road network? So countries that are gonna link and send their goods into a country, if we're not gonna ship, you've got to have ports. If we're gonna get do it on the, on the the uh, from Cape to Cairo, so to speak, you've got to have a rail or a road network. Countries should be planning and putting rail in, in place. Countries should be planning and putting uh, a road network and road infrastructure in place. Uh, and these are enablers for us to move our goods. If we don't have uh, logistic networks that we can move our goods intra-country, we cannot sell to each other. We can want to sell. If we don't have shipping companies that are moving our goods and we're not at the mercy of other countries and economies to move our goods, where are the shipping companies on Africa that are gonna come and move the goods until we develop the rail and the road network? So these are the things that we need to look at. The enabling environment, but also the capital, but also looking at entrepreneurs who will produce these goods. So you've got to look at it from a three multi-pronged approach. I'll, I'll stop there, Lady Shai. Thank you so much, Dr. Nmeko, and thank you everyone for participating. It's really been an engaging and insightful session. We are moving on now to the USB program interview, um, overview. Um, like I said, we are going to highlight the various programs that are available at the USB. So if you are interested in um, if you're interested in taking any of these programs and want to know more, please stay on. We are going to just wait for a couple of minutes for the house to be full. If you'd like to take a comfort break, stretch your legs, grab a cup of coffee, please do so now before we come back. I think in about um, two, three minutes, we will be back to start the session. So thank you once again.
tú You know that I love you, baby I'm from the world, more you know what you, baby I'll go to anything for you Okay, good afternoon, everyone, once again. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are about to start the information session. Um, please feel free to send your messages through the chat, um, uh, the chat box. You can engage with us there, send your comments, your questions, um, your concerns, just drop them in the chat box. Kindly also help us mute your microphones. We do want to see your faces. So if you have a very strong or a very good network, please you are free you can feel free to um put on your your cameras but um kindly help us mute your mics and um we are going to go into a very a very encouraging and um inform informative session right now so the way we're going to run the program today is we are going to have the program overview and we have a very competent um lecturer to take us through the various programs that the usb has to offer um, he's going to go in depth into the various programs, give us an overview of those programs. And after that, there is going to be program discussion. So that session, um, you can ask all your questions. You want to know about school fees. You want to know about various opportunities that are available. You want to know whether the programs are online or they are physical. All of your questions will be answered during the program discussions. And after the discussions are over, we will bring the entire session to a close. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker who is going to give us an, the overview of all the programs. And I'm talking about no other person than Dr. Yako Volschkenk. Dr. Yako is a senior lecturer in strategy and sustainability, and he heads the MBA program at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. And I'd like to mention here that I did the MBA and um, Dr. Yako was one of my lecturers. And I must say that he was, I enjoyed his, uh, his classes very, very much. So those of us that will be coming to the USB for our session, I'm sure some of us will have the privilege of having Dr. Yako as our lecturer. He has worked with a number of South African and global institutions, including the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, Ned Bank, World Bank, and USAID. He consults in the area of strategy, environmental sustainability, and energy policy. Dr. Volschenk is furthermore published in the area of competition, energy, sustainability, as well as microfinance. He also regularly participates in environmental cleanup initiatives. So Dr. Yako, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Um, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Lady Shea. Can I just, uh, can you hear me fine? Yes, I can. Yes, we can. Perfectly. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that introduction. I, I wish my mom could hear that. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much for everyone who's joining us tonight. Um, I'll be sharing the screen just now. So let me get that in place and then we can get going. So um, as Lady Shea uh, suggested, I will give a quick overview of the school and also of the programs of the school. Um, but I will leave a the details about those different programs for a little bit later. So let me just uh, start over here. And there we go. I'm just going to move the gallery to the side. So if you do have a question, please feel free to put up your hand or to unmute yourself and interrupt me. Um, I'm, I've got about 20 minutes to do the initial introduction, but it may be a little bit shorter than that. Uh, so that we have more time because we we won't be breaking into breakouts or anything like that tonight. So we will have time to, to look at this. Before we get going, let me maybe just uh, quickly run a poll. I would like you to just tell me which of the programs it is that you are interested in. Uh, I believe you can choose more than one on this list. So see if you can find a program that you are mostly interested in. So it goes from all the way from the PhD in business and business administration. So that's the, the PhD, BMA, the MBA, there's also the PGD. So for most of the masters, there's also a PGD or postgraduate diploma equivalent. Uh, and then there's also uh, some others, like for instance, the PGD in uh, finance, finance, which uh, is only at a PGD level. So 
please take your selection there. I can see only four people have voted so far. If you don't have a, an interest in, in, well, or not a specific interest in any of these, uh, feel free not to vote at all. But otherwise, that will also help me to, to see uh, which direction we go. I see a few people choosing the PhD in development finance. I would just like to confirm that there actually will not be an intake for the PhD in development finance next year. So if maybe uh, one of the Henry, I think Henry is online, Henry is from USB. He can also maybe assist us in, in just uh, confirming that. Henry, if you could maybe just in the chat section, uh, make, confirm that please. Well, yeah. either you, uh, yes, Henry. Yeah, so yeah, for the 2022 intake, there will be no PhD in development finance. Um, um, we can say that the program has reached its capacity. So applications will open again in 2022 for 2023. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, that, that does help a lot. Uh, it's also just to not to create expectations. Of course, the PhD in BMA, the PhD in uh, future studies, those will still be running next year. So please stay on if you would like to be interested, if you are interested in those. All right, so I have uh, a few votes here. Let me end the poll. I will just quickly share this uh, so that we've got an idea. Um, actually, I think maybe some of you would have seen my screen while I was sharing, but uh, you can see quite a few people interested in the MBA or the PG DIP in BMA. Then a few in development finance, which we just mentioned will not be running next year. And then the development finance masters in PG DIP that will definitely run again next year and then there's phd future studies mphil and future studies um, i don't see anyone online for management coaching or leadership development and then there's one person for uh, project management right let me stop sharing that and let, let's get going so firstly i will give an overview of the school so this is a picture that was taken of the business school from a hill in the stellenbosch direction but you can see the Turtle mountain in the background the picture for those of you that are not from south africa this picture is a little bit misleading i think because we are approximately i would think about 15 to 20 kilometers from the center of cape town but what's really nice about the campus is that it is very much in within reach of the city and that in the other direction in the Stellenbosch direction you've got uh, wine farms as close as five minutes away from you so very very nice location uh, looks across the, the the outskirts the northern suburbs the flatter areas of Cape Town very very much visible from from here all right a little bit more about the the school so I heard one of the um, participants earlier mentioning that we need more managers and fewer leaders. Now, I think there's a, a possible disconnect between those two. I certainly agree that, you know, I was in a session once and someone said, oh, you know, if, uh, if everyone's leaders, who's going to do the management? Now, certainly that's not the approach followed by the business school, but I think underlying any manager should also be a very strong component of leadership. Uh, how do we distinguish between the two? Just to make that clear, um, they say managers do the things right and, and leaders do the right things. And I think we want to have both of those. So do not think that on the MBA or any of the other degrees that it's going to be purely just leadership and fluffy. Uh, it's definitely going to be in how you make things happen. So I'll take us back here to the vision of the school. The, the vision of the school uh, is to be globally recognized as a source of value for a better world. So you can see a very strong intention from the school to make a difference. And one of the biggest ways in which make a difference is through our alumni, but also through our students. And if you follow any of our faculty members on LinkedIn, you would constantly see how we uh, point out things which our alumni are busy with, things that our students are busy with. And we like to see examples of where our students make the world a better place. The mission of the school, it's, it looks very academic, but through knowledge advancement, that's research and transformative learning. That's what happens in the classroom, but also a little bit outside of the classroom. We develop responsible leaders who positive, positively impact society. So you can see those three components uh, of the school, it's research, it's teaching, but also the impact component of that. 
On the value side, I don't want to delve too much into these, but I think it's very important to see that we stand for excellence, we stand for equity. If you know the history of Stellenbosch, you know that there's a, a long history and um, that a part of the history, which also should be acknowledged that we were part of apartheid and all of that. So a very strong part of the school's vision and mission and its values is to commit uh, towards restitution, fairness, and inclusivity. And you see that in everything that we do, uh, that we try to bring about that, um, that element of restitution. Also then respect, uh, value creation, accountability, and compassion. And I think one of the things that always stand out for me, and that's something that students mention a lot about the business school, is this warm culture of the school. That uh, when students come to campus, there's a very close-knit group of students. Uh, even if you start, study the blended program, you would still be coming to campus. You would still be, uh, once a year, you'll be on campus for a block, depending on which program, from five to ten days. But it's just there so that you can meet the rest of your cohort. Uh, because that element, that physical element, is still very important. And we want people to connect. Uh, the, the paradox is, is that the more we go online, the more people feel the need to connect. And definitely, that's something that we try to achieve in the MBA, as well as any of the other programs of the USB. So 10 reasons to study at USB. Uh, well, firstly, keep hashtag keep learning. And I will explain what I mean with that just now, but we want to create learning pathways for people that they can start with a PGD, they can follow with a master's, and they can complete their studies with a PhD. And even, even after that, they can continually still keep on learning. We, you can study with a school with three international accreditations. In fact, we are on our way for a fourth. And the only reason why we don't have the fourth is because, well, no one has the fourth yet because it's the Association of African Business Schools or ABS accreditation. And that's quite an important one for us because we see ourselves very strongly rooted in Africa. Thirdly, grow as a responsible leader. I think that's something that we see that a lot of students report on and again, Back to the point that the delegate made, delegate, uh, delegate made earlier, um, one of my friends studied his MBA and I knew him before his MBA and he came here for the hard things, for the accounting, for finance, for all of those things and he did say the area that he felt that he grew the most in was in fact in the leadership element and he came with a PhD in political science. So actually that that was really interesting to me that that element, that's the area that he still enjoyed the most as, a, as, a, as, as growth. Fourthly, the convenience of blended learning. Now, I think what's really important is that USB doesn't do online MBAs. We, didn't do, we don't do online qualifications. What I mean with that, we don't send you to look at a bunch of videos and then ask you questions and then we give you a degree afterwards. It's really important for us to do synchronous learning. In other words, to interact with people in a classroom environment, or even if that's a virtual classroom, classroom environment, something like this that we have here, with a difference that under normal circumstances, I would like you to talk a lot more than, than I'm doing at the moment. Uh, but we, we have that aspect of blended where it means you will be physically on campus once a year. You will also come to campus for electives if that's included in the program that you're taking. But on the other side, there's also an element of having online learning um, and synchronous and a little bit of asynchronous at times. Then fifthly, gain a global perspective. Even though we see ourselves as an African school, we strongly believe that we want to be globally relevant, which is one of the reasons that we have three accreditations. We want you to be able to go from a qualification from USB to be able to teach, uh, to, to work anywhere in the world uh, so that your degree will be recognized by anyone. But not only that, also being in a classroom where there are people from many different cultures and many different companies and to learn from each other. Continuing on with the 10, tap into our areas of expertise. I think one of, one of the most, and this is reflected in the interest tonight, one of the strongest areas of expertise is development finance. So the masters, the PGD, as well as the PhD in development finance, uh, which looks at those organizations that um, want to 
finance development that want to improve Africa through making uh, financial instruments available that enable that. Also, number seven, use collaborative learning to advantage. As I said, we don't do online learning. You are part of a team. So maybe just to use some of the language that we use, we talk of cohorts. So you might have the PGD in BMA next year, which will be the 2022 cohort. But in that cohort, you also have teams. So you will be part of a team, and that's typically five to seven students in a team. And you work together with them on some of your modules and some of your team projects. Then also number eight, benefit from the school's business connections. We've got one of the strongest, in fact, uh, I know Christelle Cronier is online. She will say it's the school with the strongest alumni network in Africa. So we've got many alumni that are today CEOs, CFOs, you mean a, many C-suite uh, people. And being part of this school means that you have connect, connectedness with those people. We often have functions where we invite both current students and our alumni in different areas. So we usually do that throughout South Africa. We've done it in Namibia. We've done it in Nigeria as well. So we do this wherever we have got a critical mass of alumni, we will do that. Then remain relevant through business knowledge we share. So you will often like tonight uh, with Dr. Maleko, the information she shared. I think this is something that's really important to me, and, but, but I'm an academic, but, I, but let me explain this. One of the biggest measures of intellectual leadership is citations. Citations is how often you get mentioned by other researchers. If we take the per capita, in other words, the per person references or the citations, USB is by far the strongest school in Africa. There's no other school that's even close to the number of citations per capita that what USB has, which tells you thought leadership in an academic sense. But as you heard from uh, uh, Dr. Maleku, very much, very practical and relatable to what we need in Africa. And then last one, join a school with strong social impact. Uh, I think I'm still to see a school in South Africa that has the strong drive for social impact. And with that, we don't mean nonprofit organizations. We mean that organizations exist to make the world better. No matter what you do, ask yourself, is this organization making the world better? And if not, we would say, well, we need to question what that organization can do uh, to be closer to what they should be. I did refer to this earlier, but yeah, I want to make the point about vertical um, learning pathways and horizontal learning pathways. So we've got all these, let, let's call it competencies at the top. We are known for our MBA and the PGD. We are known for development finance. In fact, we were the first school in Africa to start a master's degree in development finance. Uh, we are very much known for our future studies. In fact, I think we're consistently globally in the top three for master's and future studies. We've got coaching project management, leadership, and financial planning. And when you look at the horizontal uh, rows, that distinguishes between programs that have PG dips or postgraduate diplomas. And those of you that still know the old South African system, that's what they used to refer to as honors degrees. So you can do the PG dip BMA, PG dip development finance, and a number of others, but then you can progress into the masters and eventually also into the PG PhD. Now, in South Africa, we use the National Qualifications Framework language. So the PG dips are all at NQF 8, NQF 9, or NQF 10. And to gain access to a, an NQF 9 qualification, in other words, a master's, you need to have an NQF 8 qualification, or at least we can also apply for what's known as recognition of prior learning. But it means that you, we need to be convinced that you are at the level of NQF 8 even if you don't have that qualification. So with vertical learning pathways, we mean that anyone can move up into these streams, but what we also want, and this is one of the reasons why we redesigned the PG DIP in the last few years. So in 2022, we're launching the new PG DIP format, which allows you to go from a PG DIP BMA into a PG DIP development finance. But I'll explain a little bit more about that. So 
there's what's known as the blended learning format or the modular format. And please stop me if you have questions because this can be confusing, but you can see that all our programs are available in a blended format. Some of our programs are also available in modular. Now, the best way to explain this is blended format is like a marathon. You come to campus at the beginning of your degree and you come here for five to 10 days, depending on which program it is, you meet your cohort and then you go away and you go back to Kenya, Nigeria, uh, Iswatini, any other place, and you will be staying there while you study. So every, for the MBA, for instance, every Tuesday or Wednesday evening, you join classes for four hours and that happens every week for the rest of your program. And next year, at the beginning of the year, you come back again, you come back for your electives, come back if there's an international tour involved, etc. So that's the blended format. Uh, it's physical at the beginning, but after that, um, it's mostly people that attend virtually almost like we do now. With the blended format, those of the students that are close to campus still have the option to attend the classes on campus, and the rest of the class then is online. So that's the, the blended or the local classroom as it's sometimes referred to. The modular format means that you come to campus in blocks. So similar to the blended student, you also have a starting block, but then every two months or so, you will come back to campus and you're here for a full week from eight in the morning until six in the evening, you are in class, of course, with some breaks in between, with some interactive exercises. So it's, it's really exciting, but that's meant for people that feel you know they need to step away from their work they need to be able to focus for that one week but it is not always that easy for anyone to do so the modular is for more for people that prefer face to face uh, in both cases you apply as you learn and you can um, come to campus a few times during the year if you study in the blended format it, it means that you will still have synchronous sessions in other words you are there with the faculty member in the classroom virtually, and some students are physically in a classroom on campus. You, so you can join on campus or online. And what's quite important about Blended and something that I like a lot is that there is a lower opportunity cost. It means that you don't have to fly to Cape Town every few months. It also means you don't have to pay for accommodation and things like that. So it is a little bit softer on the pocket, uh, but Again, I don't find people doing blended because it's cheaper. I find people doing blended or modular because it, it suits their particular needs uh, better than what the other does. I'm not sure if there are any questions at this point. Okay, let me move on. So the new postgraduate diploma, you can see uh, the different PGDs. Um, I'm not gonna focus too much on all these different aspects. Uh, you can see here uh, that one of the benefits is that, uh, let me just go here. This is roughly what the structure looks like. So the red bands, these are, if you do, for instance, BMA, business management, business management and administration, that would be your stream in your second year. I'll, I'll get to that just now again, development finance, futures or project management. Now, if you do the PGD over two years, these will be the modules in your first year. If, and then in your second year, you will specialize in whichever stream that you would like to follow. So you have a year to make up your mind about which of the specialization phases you would like to do. But you also have the option to do the whole PGD in one year. So in term one, you will then do understanding the world and you will do one of these modules. And we programmed or we designed the program in such a way that you have that flexibility. Of course, you will have to have more time available if you want to do the two at the same time. In other words, you want to fit it in a year. But that's what PG, did, PG dips do at the moment uh, in, in many of the cases. So it's completely doable. Um, and I think that's quite an important feature. What I wanted to make the point is, no matter which of these PGDs you do, you will in term one all be in understanding the world um, uh, classroom. So all the students will be in there. If there are 500 students across all four of these programs, all 500 will be in the same class. So you get the opportunity to get many different views, which is often what people miss when they do these um, speciality PG dips. 
okay, let me just step one back. So you have a lot of flexibility with USB programs, with the PGDIP specifically. So you've got duration. You can do it in one year or over two years. Uh, you've got format flexibility. You can come to campus or you can do it online in a synchronous online like we're doing here. You have a program flexibility, so you can change your specialization in year two. And of course, also then um, you have access flexibility. You can complete part of your studies as standalone short courses. So what's sometimes referred to as micro-credential, micro-credentials. All right, just something that's, and this is very technical, but how much data does it take to have a class? So one-on-one, -on -one, if you and I are in a meeting, it takes about 540 megabytes. Uh, if, you're, if you are in class with your video off, it's about 740, and with your video on, it's about double that. So this is just something to be aware of that you will have to buy data or have access to data. So a lot of our students use fiber and uncapped so they don't really affected by that, but make sure that you will have this in order to be on a blended program, you need to have access and certain speeds, but that information is all in our brochures, which are available online. And um, if you need more information, we can send this to you after tonight. All right, international students, there are quite a few important uh, issues. Contact the international office, please. Uh, they will give you all this information. I'm not going to go through the slide in detail, um, but something that is important is we are still in, in a period of, of COVID restrictions. So we've got a nationwide curfew. Sometimes travel is restricted. Maybe that's just something I need to say, that if you are in a country that's restricted from travel and it is the first block of the year, which I said is actually a physical block, you will still be allowed to attend that block virtually. Uh, it's not our preference because you lose a lot of that interaction with the rest of your team, but um, it is still potentially possible to do so. Um, I think this is, here we say, MBA students have a compulsory one-week international study module as part of the MBA. Uh, in cases where COVID didn't allow us to do that, we do them virtually, uh, but then we give money back to students because the ISM is one of the more expensive modules and we, we refund uh, quite a substantial amount of money back to students when the ISM cannot happen. Okay, so um, I'm going to briefly just introduce the different programs, uh, and then if there are any specific questions, we can go through that. So firstly, uh, Tasneem Mutala is the head of the PGDIP uh, BMA. So like I said, the PGDIP is the same first year, and in the second year you split. So just to make a quick overview of that, um, it's ideal start a business type of program. Uh, what's nice about the PG dips uh, is that they don't come with a research component. So people that really want to be practical about it, um, they they enjoy the PG dip. The the master's degrees in South Africa, and this is quite important to know. But uh, in South Africa, if it's a master's, it must have a research component. But the way that the research is structured in all our programs is almost like a normal course. So your introduction section is due after the first month in that module. Then the literature review is after two months, the methods after three months. So it's a gated approach and that makes it very accessible, very easy to finish your research in a very structured way um, and so on. All right. So Important about the PGWMA, strong focus on essential management skills and responsible leadership, also strong focus on entrepreneurship, and it provides a gateway to the MBA. So if you have uh, a certain uh, level of, of performance in your, in your PGWMA, you automatically gain access into the MBA. What's also really great about the PGDIP and the MBA is if you do the PGDIP BMA, you actually get some of the courses on the MBA, there are four of them. Uh, we, you get some of those courses off, so you don't have to attend them, and you also don't pay for them. So your MBA becomes cheaper if you've also done the PG Dip BMA with us. If you did the PG Dip with another institution, unfortunately, you don't have that opportunity. You might be asked to, to still repeat um, those. Um, Right, let me just go to the next program. So the, the MBA, 
Uh, let me just flip through these. Right, on the MBA, uh, we mentioned three international accreditations, strong focus on responsible leadership. You've got flexibility of two formats, different streams. I'll tell you about the streams just now. There's an international study module included. Uh, also, a lot of focus on the African context, and but then also uh, a lot of the case studies are on global companies. And Contemporary decision making is a core module on the MBA, which we find that students uh, enjoy a lot. So I want to make that point. You know, even though we're known for responsible leadership, there are things like that our MBA is very known for. In every year in the financial mail survey, we, they ask employers, what do you know MBA students for from USB? Three things stand out. Um, one is leadership, and that's always the strongest one, I would say. And we get a lot of students studying at USB because they work with people that see leadership in people that have done MBAs at, at USB. Secondly, um, strategic management skills, the strategy. So um, strategic insights, et cetera. So they're impressed by people. And thirdly, uh, the quantitative skills. So despite being very much leadership orientated, we are one of the most quantitative MBAs uh, are certainly known in, known in South Africa. I would guess on the African continent and even globally. So, so we we do have a lot of decision making um, content in there as well. So I mentioned four different streams on the MBA: the generalist stream. So that's the historical MBA. It's, it's aimed at senior levels who want to make an impact in and around the organization. So you can see impact is very strong for us. A, a stream that was developed with the United Nations uh, is the MIO stream. So that's focused on management managers in development organizations, things like World Health, World Health Organization, the UN, uh, USAID, all of those fit in there. But also, if you're in an organization and you are part of the ethics committee, or part of the impact committee, uh, this would still be a stream that would be of interest to you. you. Again, you only make this choice on this stream in the second year of your MBA, so you don't have to make this choice right at the beginning. Then there's healthcare leadership, which is uh, very attractive, and we've got students from across the world that do healthcare leadership. So we've had students from India, we've had students from Belgium. Um, I've, I'm currently, I interviewed a student yesterday from Germany, very much, and this is one of the benefits that you have with this online environment, with synchronous online classes, you can create what's known as, as tribes, people that are interested in the same thing, and you can bring them across from across, you can bring them together from across the world. So the healthcare leadership for professionals who want to understand the principles of clinical governance, um, healthcare specific challenges in the African context, and also maximize the impact in the healthcare sector. Uh, and then the last one, the MBA with specialization in project management, that is for senior managers who wish to be proficient in both project portfolio management as well as key business disciplines. Um, what's really great about the uh, MBA in project management is that it is endorsed by uh, PMI, which is the Project Management Institute of South Africa. Oh, I see there's the, the, project, the project management uh, institute dropped off in the slide, but PMI um, is, this is the only program that is endorsed by them. All right, I don't want to say two more. I think I've, I've, I've dealt with this already. The things that the USB MBA stand out for, you can see there, lead with responsibility, thinking strategically. Um, we are the only MBA in South Africa that have the compulsory international study module. So you will be going to another country to experience how managers function in that environment. Again, if it doesn't happen, you would still do it virtually. Okay, I'm not gonna focus on that. I would like to just go to the next program. Um, the PhD in BMA. So for this, you need to have a master's. It's two years in duration. If you take longer than that, you get love letters from us to say you need to finish soon. Uh, again, our PhD is highly regarded and it's because it is um, 
so structured and you are expected to present at colloquia quite often. So you have to come back to us and you present to a group of academics and you get feedback on your PhD. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons why it is a very popular place to do PhDs because the support for our PhD program is really great. Um, why, why you want to do a PhD is a very different question. It's a very painful journey. Um, it does have its, its benefits, but um, make sure that you do the PhD for the right reasons. Now, maybe just at this point, I should also repeat, there are open days for each of our programs. And please, in the week of, I think it's the 4th of October, in that whole week, we will have uh, open days for specific programs. So if you want to know more about the MBA or the PGD BMA, make sure that you attend one of those sessions. It's roughly about, I think, an hour uh, in duration, and it deals much more in detail with the different programs. The PGD de in, in development finance, I'm going to speed it up a little bit, but um, I said that our master's in development finance was the first in Africa, and then we used to get a lot of applications of people that couldn't qualify for the master's, so that's why we created the PG DIP. So it creates a pathway for people to go into the master's in development finance as well. But quite a lot of people do the PG DIP development finance and they say, you know what, um, I think I know enough now, um, but that's the minority, but, but still you have that option. And once you finish that year, you walk away with a postgraduate diploma. So the focus of the PG DIP development finance, helping Africa to grow sustainably, very much the kind of thing that, uh, that Dr. Moleko spoke about. Uh, provide financial and operational input uh, in terms of development finance issues, shape development policies and projects, provide inputs for reports, build valuable networks. That's really important to us. The development finance PG DIP, as well as the masters, is the most diverse student population on campus. Uh, it's absolutely great. It's like an international conference when people are here. You've got people from from Kenya, Cameroon, DRC, Nigeria. We've got always got a very strong contingent of Ghanaians that attend our courses. Um, Botswana, Zimbabwe is very strong. So mostly English speaking countries, but it's great to be in those classrooms and hear the kind of debates that happen there. Um, all right, uh, let me go on. So again, I think the admission criteria is very similar to some of the others. But you can see that this is, well, it doesn't say so anywhere, but you have to have a bachelor's degree uh, or any three year with at least two years of relevant experience or recognition of prior learning. So for the PGD in development finance, you need an NQF7 qualification because itself is NQF8, um, but that will allow you once you've got the PGD, you can go into the M full development finance. So again, this is over two years, there's a research component uh, it's a gateway to the PhD and the PhD, so you can see that learning pathway uh, that's happening vertically. Um, and these are the things which we think the development finance stand out for. Uh, develop Africa where it matters, contributing towards sustainable development. Um, acquiring critical skills for needing that in-depth research, etc. And again, the element of building networks. I know that there were one or two people on future studies. This is one of our most highly regarded programs at USB, very, very well known. If you know Professor Andre Rue, he's the head of this program. Um, I recently saw a, uh, a Twitter picture of Tito Mboweni. Tito Mboweni was a past minister of finance and he showed a picture of wine on his table. Uh, but next to, the, next to the glass of wine was a book by Andre Rue on the South African economy. So very, very highly regarded as an economist and very well known for uh, the future studies aspect that we do as well. So um, again, you know, the PG DIP runs that first year is the same as all the other PG DIPs, but in your second year, you really start looking at these things for forward thinking, uh, thank thinkers and strategists. So we do actually get, and, and this is an important point, people finish their MBA at USB and then say, but I don't want to do a PhD. What else can I do? A lot of students actually go into future studies after that because it is a different way of looking at strategy. So 
It's in two formats, uh, modular and blended. It's the only PG dip in future studies in Africa. You can do it over one or two years, and it's a gateway to the infill. Um, designing the future you want, handle complexity in organizations, all of that is important. So the infill, I think I've dealt with this, but for strategists, uh, managing directors, CEOs, anyone that's involved in strategic planning. So how do you create the future that you want? Um, it is the only MPhil in futures studies in Africa. And again, it allows you to go into the PG, PhD. I'm not going to focus on many of the other programs. I don't think there were anyone for coaching. So I'm not going to deal with coaching. Also, no one for leadership. And I know that there was uh, one person that mentioned the postgraduate diploma in project management. So um, this is MC Buerta. MC Buerta, Buerta has been with the business school for a number of years, but actually never been full-time employed by us because he's so busy in his private capacity and brings a wealth of knowledge about project management um, to the table. So who's the PG dip in project management for? for people that want to manage projects with confidence, acquiring a scarce skill. So you can see the difference here between the PGD project management and the M is that the PGD is about managing projects and the masters in the MBA part is more about the portfolio of, of programs that you want. Um, it's very, very, it's a very popular, it's actually one of our most popular PGD programs and it's a internationally accredited but it's also recognized by the PMI, um, or I'm talking now about the MBA one, but the, the programs in project management is highly regarded uh, in South Africa. What's important about this PG DIP is that it gives you access to the MBA in project management. So we don't allow, so for instance, for healthcare leadership, you need to be involved with healthcare leadership to go into that master's. Similarly, with the MBA in project management, you need to be have done the PG dip in project management or have done academic work within project management. And that's quite important. There's also the PG dip in financial planning. I don't recall seeing anyone that said that they were interested in that. So I'm not going to focus on that, but it's a highly regarded and we are consistently the school with the highest pass rate. These, these students are typically much younger, uh, but it still gives you if you're the right age with the right qualifications and the right experience, it can still give you access into the MBA. All right, I think, um, you know, I've probably bored you to death. I hope I haven't. But if there are any specific questions, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Yako. The floor is now open for questions, concerns um, about any of the programs that have been highlighted. You can just drop your questions in the chat box or alternatively raise your hand if you want to speak and Dr. Yako is available to answer your questions. I'll just use this opportunity um, to extend our apologies from Professor Mishak. He unfortunately took ill. He was supposed to be part of today's session, but we wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, I think um, Dr. Moleko is also still available to take, yes, she's still available to take some of the questions um, for anyone um, who would want to know more. I have one here in the chat box that says, I would like info mm -hmm. on postgraduate diploma in financial planning. Um, so um, Dr. Yako, if you could just maybe throw a bit more light on the diploma in financial planning while we wait for further questions. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that. And sorry if I missed you in the survey earlier. So the, um, the finance, the, PG Dep in Financial Planning is headed by uh, Dr. Leanne Steenkamp, very, very highly regarded in, in her area. Um, and it's a one year program. And you will be the, you will have the FBI or an FBI, uh, I think it's the Financial Planning Institute accredited qualification at the end of it. Um, you will also be, it will be a stepping stone for you to become a certified financial planner. So what's great about it is a lot of the qualifications or the, the exams that you have to write to be a certified financial planner, you know, you have to do a self-study, I think. Um, I'm speaking on the correction here, but this program really assists you to, to, to do better with this, to be uh, taught in a structured way, to 
be with a cohort, to work with other students that are in the same position. Um, and it, it is one of our, I think it's one of the biggest programs on the MBA campus. So it is very, very popular. So there's one on-campus orientation day and then two weekly real-time online. So like I mentioned, four hours a week. It's a little bit like a marathon. Um, I, I now remember I didn't complete that train of thought earlier. Modulars are more like sprints. You have a rest period in between blocks and then you sprint for a week. With the, with the blended format, it's much more, you've got more time to absorb between this week and next week. If you don't follow in class, it, it tells you that you haven't kept up. So it gives you a little bit more opportunity to catch up back, back with the content. Let me just see, there are, um, uh, are there any other questions? Elda Any says that questions? she feels that she missed, might have heard the whole session. Yeah, um, I think Lizelle should address that. Apparently, somebody said that the session was not available until 1845. Um, I don't know what Is, happened. Can I just hear if the session was recorded? Yeah, the session, I think the session is being recorded. So she can, okay. yeah. Yeah, that's not ideal. Um, uh, Elda, maybe just the, there will be in the week of the 4th of October, there are open day specializations. So if you are interested in one specific program, the week of the 4th of October, you can dial in for one hour on a specific program. If you want to hear about more than one program, of course, you can attend more than one open day, but it's much more focused than tonight. Um, so my apologies if you missed some of this. The recording is available, but you can also go to the open days later on. Um, Chair, can I just say something, please? Yes, Crystal. Yes, Yako. I think the reference to the quarter to seven was our USB events matter uh, that went out about half past six. So I can okay. see the numbers there registering. Um, but I would like to also note that there's next week, same time, um another session and i will put in the chat box now the link to register for that one so anyone who's missed anything please join us next tuesday uh, next thursday evening thanks i see a question from franklin about the next admission session for m development finance uh, franklin you can apply for the development finance from now onwards that's not the problem are you asking about a uh about the open day sessions or are you more asking about applying for it for admission you can you feel free to unmute yourself yes i'm i'm, I'm asking good evening i'm asking for the admission process proper uh, the ad admission process. Of the, of the, yeah, the admission process and commencement of the next session. All right. So I think the the uh, Henry can possibly help you with that. If you can drop your email address in the in the comment section, Henry can get your email address and he can engage with you about the process. But also, if you have access to the website, the brochure is on there, and the brochure then makes makes clear. Um, what kind of information we require from you, uh, which link you should click on to apply, and, and you can take it from there. Thank you. Fantastic. But thanks for joining. Okay. Um, I'm seeing also in the chat box that um, um, there's a message that, that hosting sessions, virtual open day programs will be open from 4th to 11th of October. And I think um, Dr. Yako has mentioned that um, event registrations will be open from September. However, I don't know, um, Christelle or Lisa, is it possible that people drop their email addresses or um, are you going to send a reminder to everybody on this um, call so that um, they can register yep. at the appropriate time? Yes. Yes, I will do that, um, Shayo, and all everybody on this. We will send a, um, a notice of the way to register for mm -hmm. next week to everyone on this, um, in this room. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. So if there are, I don't know if there are any more questions, um, that's 
people are concerned about. I think the links have been dropped for further information. And I also think um, that this presentation will be available uh, to everybody so that people can go back and read it into read it in more detail. Um, so I don't know if there are any further questions, comments, concerns. If not, Christelle, I hand over to you. I've asked tomorrow. Frankly, you might want to mute your mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if there are no further questions, um, comments, anybody else is raising hand. I think this is a good time to adjourn. So Thank I'd like you. to say, that, Christelle, do you have any further comments? Um, just to say warm thank you to everybody, especially to Yaku and yourself um, for keeping us entertained for you, actually for two hours. <laughs> and Yaku, thank you for all that great information. Also for Ilza um, and the team for preparing um, um, the slides and everything. Um, this is usually the overview of the program information for next year. But Ilza has also mentioned there in the chat that there will also, of course, be um, the open days, which will give you a much more intense focus on each of the programs with the um, relevant um, program heads. So at least between now and then, you have some time to think about what Yaku said, um, to browse on the web, to ask the ambassadors questions, and then please, you can join us next week as well. Um, we will be having the Ghana session um, with a speaker. And then, of course, more information. And the week after that will be the East Africa group and information. You're welcome to join all of them. Um, and then for the more intense, um, in-depth discussions during the open days. So we hope you to see you at all those events and to see you on campus or at least virtual in 2022. A warm thank you, Shayo. You've had yeah, a I think somebody session. has a hand raised. I don't know if Yako can quickly address her question. Oh, yes, of course. Elda has her hand raised. Yes. So, Elda, if you can quickly um, unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Just a brief question. I'm not even sure whether this is the correct platform for it. I've mm -hmm. applied for a postgrad in um, development finance. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to know when is one likely to receive feedback on the application? How long ago did you apply, Elder? <laughs> I think about a week ago. I, th I think if uh, they should be in contact with you, if you submit all the information, then it's just yeah. a process of going through the selection. Uh, but I think Henry, Henry would also be able to tell you, um, if you just drop in an, in an email, uh, he okay. would be able to tell you how far the application is. It usually doesn't take that long. We we try to be very quick, okay. uh, you know, because I, I think it's important for you. And we know that students want to know as quickly as possible. And they're sometimes anxious about whether they would be accepted. Um, but you can drop Henry a, a, a note and he can tell you tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. All good. Okay, then. Christel, so uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, Thanks to all our speakers. Thanks to all our participants. Um, it's been um, a wonderful session. I've, 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 I've been refreshed anyway. And final note from me, who's an ex-student, coming to the USB is a wonderful experience. It's a wonderful campus, wonderful people, a wonderful support. I remember my very first experience. I, I missed my flight and I lost all my luggage. Um, the US, and I remember that my liaison officer was my saving grace. You know, they, were, they are wonderful people. It's a wonderful experience. So do apply quickly, and I'm sure you'd all be accepted. Thank you so much. I see that um, Henry just asked that um, Elder should drop her email in the comment section or maybe to him directly as well. So let's, let's maybe just keep the session open for her to be able to do that. Okay. I, I actually did drop it, but I don't know why am I just, it's directed to Lizelle. Um, okay, well, Lizelle, Lizelle would be able to send it on to Henry. Thanks, Elder. Okay, is it that, Henry that Boyson? Should, Henry Boyson, that's right. Okay. But Thank from our side as well, um, I, I know that the information can be quite dry. I hope, I hope that you were able to gain the information that you liked or that you wanted from this. Uh, but thanks for joining tonight. It was really great to have all of you here. Thank you, Thank you. Cheo. Thanks, Christelle. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Henry. Everyone. Yeah.
Yeah. Have a great evening further. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye, Crystal. Bye, Shia. Bye, Bye, Natalie.